Um, I actually want to figure out what everybody does here, so I'm not going to ask who's a developer, who's a designer, because I don't know, if you're like me, then you do all sorts of different things. So I'll, let me phrase it this way. Who, as part of their work, does any front-end development, HTML or CSS or JavaScript? Okay. Who, as part of their work or play, does any visual design, graphic design, anything like that? Who does more on the user experience side of things? Okay. What about like project planning and marketing? Okay. And everything else? Okay. Okay. So a good mix. Yeah. So I decided I wasn't going to dive into like code or anything this evening because I figured it'd be quite a mix. Um, so what I wanted to do was kind of I wanted to put uh, responsive design into more of a historical perspective. Um, so look at the, the history of the web and, and maybe even further back. I, I want to start with this, which is something that Tim Berners-Lee wrote uh, a couple of years ago on the anniversary of the web. I think this was in Scientific American, where he was reiterating the design principles that he had in mind when he created uh, the World Wide Web. And you can see that the watchwords are things like universality right, and, and accessibility, that this, this whole idea of the web is, is kind of amazing when you think about it, that it doesn't matter what it is you're publishing, you know, whether it's a, you know, something silly or something really important, whether it's an app or a site, whatever those mean, um, that it's potentially accessible to anyone in the world, right? anyone able to connect to the internet. I and mean, we forget these days how amazing it is, the World Wide Web, the fact that it doesn't matter what operating system your computer is running, you can access a web page as long as you have you know, a web browser that's capable of connecting to the internet. It, it seems perfectly normal to us now. And that's, it was actually amazing at the time, right? It didn't matter what the, what the different platforms were that you're using. Here's this cross-platform thing. Uh, and he reiterated, like right at the start, he said, it, it should be accessible from any kind of hardware that can connect to the internet, right? Whether that's stationary or mobile, whether that's small screen, large screen, doesn't matter. Everyone should be able to connect to that. And I think we could all get on board with this, right? We could all go, yes, hell yes, this is, this is good. I get behind this message. The tricky part is then how do you design for this? How do you design for a situation, for a medium where literally anybody in any situation could be accessing your content, your, your service, your product, right? Um, and to look at that, how we, how we design for that, I want to sort of look at the history of um, visual design. So I'm going to go uh, uh, back a little further than the birth of the web. This is the Book of Kells, uh, an illustrated manuscript you can see in Trinity College in Dublin. And I consider this an early form of, of visual design. And I say design and not art because there is a message here, right? There is content. It's being illustrated, being illustrated very beautifully, but there is content here. Um, and this happens to be on vellum, I believe, calfskin. Uh, done with inks, right, made by some monks off the west coast of Ireland. But fundamentally, this is still the way that visual design on a, on a, a, in a print world sort of works, is that you, you have your medium, in this case vellum, and you know the dimensions of your medium, right? The monk doing this, he knew the width and he knew the height of the piece of vellum that he's, that he's working on. Uh, and you sort of work inwards from that. Uh, and that's the way things worked for hundreds of years. The big change that came about was, of course, the invention of the printing press. But that was more a big change in terms of, of production. So the problem with, uh, with the Book of Kells is it costs and takes as much time to make the second Book of Kells as it does to make the first. And it costs just as much time to make the third or the first, fourth. Whereas with, with the printing press, suddenly the cost of production of that second, third, fourth, fifth, that goes down dramatically once you've got that, that first copy. But fundamentally, in terms of design, the way we design, and still the same principle applies, because whether it's vellum or whether it's uh, paper, you still know the dimensions of what you're designing for. In fact, if you look at the very first printed material, this is the Gutenberg Bible, you can see things that we'd recognize today, right? You see the columns, and you can see drop caps, and you see you know, conventions that we'd still use to this day. In fact, I would say the print uh, has since evolved over hundreds of years, sort of reaching its zenith, I would say, in the 20th century with the Swiss school of design, right? You've got the grid system, you've got Josef Müller Brockman and Jan Tuchold talking about um, guidelines and ways of thinking about designing for this medium, but very much based around the idea that you know the dimensions of the medium that you're designing for, right? Whether it's a poster size or, 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 or postcard size, that you're working in from knowing, knowing the, the ratios, knowing the dimensions of what you're designing with. So the fundamental idea behind something like the grid system is that you've got the page, which is what you're designing on, 
and you apply the grid system on top of that. So you have the constraint that you know, which is the page. You know the width. You know the height. You know the usually know the, the material, right? The, the the thickness of it. And by applying this system, like the grid system, you, what you get is a kind of order over the content. You're you're imposing an order as as a designer. And what that gives you as a designer is a sense of control, that you have a sense of control over what you're designing by imposing order because you know the constraint. OK, so that's print, hundreds of years of print. Then the web comes along. And uh, ah, not so much uh, to design here. I mean, to begin with, we don't even have any images. Uh, we certainly don't have any way of doing layout. It is literally just text flowing uh, inside uh, some kind of rendering engine. Um, so it seemed that designing on the web, to begin with at least, just looks like an impossible task. But we certainly tried to get that feeling of control over this new medium. Does anybody actually remember this book? Oh, wow, well, okay, we're showing our age. Yes, um, <laughs> Creating Killer Websites, uh, David Siegel. Uh, so he is, he is the guy who came up with, uh, hey, let's use tables for layout. And yet, let's use a one pixel by one pixel spacer GIF that we can, does anybody remember doing this way back? Then? Okay, not just me. Well, he invented all, all these ideas, these hacks, right? They were hacks. But they were, they, we needed those hacks back then because we had no other way of getting that control over the web. A, a couple of years later, he, he recanted. He wrote an essay called something like, I, the web is broken and I broke it, which <laughs> is maybe overstating the case, but he, he certainly had a lot of influence. So again, the, the whole point is that as designers, we want to have control. And that meant using a bunch of icky hacks. Fine, we're going to use icky hacks because we want control over this medium. So uh, what we were doing essentially on the web, very similar to what we're doing in print, is uh, we're taking our constraint, which is, which is the browser, and we're applying a system, in this case, table layout, right, to get that sense of order. And later on, we swapped table layout for CSS, right? You know, we had the web standards movement. But fundamentally, what we were doing didn't change. What we were doing was we want, we want control. We're web designers, right? Um, applying order on our known constraint, the browser. Here's the problem. The problem is, is with this and thinking of this as a known quantity, thinking of it as a known constraint, because it isn't. The browser isn't known. I mean, once, you're, once you get your document into the browser, you can query a lot of things about, about the browser, right? What, what, what is its width? What is its height? What kind of JavaScript capability it's got? But at the moment that a browser requests a page from a server, there's very, very little you know about that browser. Right? It gives you a user agent string, but that's full of lies. So <laughs> you, you, can't, you can't trust that. Um, so there's all the stuff that we just don't know. The truth is we don't know much about the browser when it makes that request. Now, I, I want to talk about you know, unknown things like the browser. So at this point, I must invoke the patron saint of all things unknown, which is this man, Donald Rumsfeld. Um, History will judge him as a warmonger, but he did once say <laughs> something very, very uh, truthful. He said, there are the known knowns, the things we know we know. There are the known unknowns, the things we know we don't know. There are also the unknown unknowns. There are things we do not know we don't know. And everyone mocked him for saying this because it sounded so ridiculous, but it's the most sensible thing anybody's ever said. It's brilliant. It's like this Zen Buddhism piece of, of wisdom. Um, and on the web, we have lots of unknowns. And these are just some of the known unknowns. Right? These are just some of the things we know we don't know when a, a browser you know, requests a document from a web server. We don't know the network speed. Right? We don't know whether someone's on a dial-up connection, a broadband connection, 3G. We don't know. There's no way to know. Uh, we don't know uh, the capability in terms of is a certain plugin installed in that browser. Like, we don't know. Does it have this particular JavaScript API or that particular JavaScript API? We don't know. What about the size? What is the width and what is the height of the viewport of the browser? We don't know, right? Just taking the size one alone, here's how we responded to not knowing. We'll pretend we know, right? When I started making websites, again showing my age, we all decided that websites were 640 pixels wide, right? Because that seemed to be normal. And then a few years later, the memo went around that it was perfectly okay to make websites that were 800 pixels wide. And a few years after that, 1,024. At some point, we all settled on this magical 960 number. That's perfect. All websites will be 960 pixels wide. But we were essentially fooling ourselves. The truth is, we still don't know, but we'll all agree to participate in this consensual hallucination that all websites are 960 pixels wide. 
So what we did was we gravitated towards fixing that, that constraint. Say, OK, we don't know the width of the browser. Let's pretend we do. Let's treat it as a fixed quantity. But we didn't need to. We could have taken a much more flexible approach, right? Uh, be more like the web itself. We could have been using percentages instead of pixels. And again, I'm not talking about CSS in particular. Back when we were using tables for layout, we could use percentages instead of pixels. And yet we chose not to. I mean, a couple of us did, but we were like the crazy people standing on the street corner shouting at the traffic, right? It's like, use percentages, be fluid. Like, no. Everyone was going fixed. And I was wondering, you know, does, was I crazy? But there were a few lone voices in the wilderness saying that this is, you know, that fixed is not the way to go, that we should be more flexible. One of those people was John Alsop, who wrote an article called A Dow of Web Design in a List Apart in 2000, at 14 years ago, he wrote this. Has anybody read A Dow of Web Design by John Alsop? Excellent. Good. You, you should all get the deconstruct tickets, actually, just for <laughs> having read the, the article. Uh, it's fantastic. I, I encourage all of you to read it. Um, and the reason is, what, what's amazing is it's more relevant now than when it was written. And it was written 14 years ago. It's this timeless piece. It's like this manifesto. It's this you know, star to sail our ship by. And, and essentially what, what John was arguing for is that we should embrace the web. We need to stop seeing the things we see as, as being constraints of the web, as being failings of the web, and embrace them as, as strengths, right? Stop trying to imitate uh, what, the print, what you could do in print design, right? I mean, at this time, everyone's complaining because, ah, we don't have any fonts to work with. Well, we've only got 216 colors. Oh, in print, you can do this. In print, you can do that. Yeah, but on the web, you can publish to the whole world. Potentially, anybody can see it using any kind of device capable of connecting to the internet, small screen or large, stationary or mobile. That's incredible. And yet, we, were, we weren't considering how that flexibility, that inherent flexibility of the web, is actually its killer feature. It's not a bug. It's a feature. And so I was wondering why. Why were designers and developers not embracing the web as its own medium? I mean, and John does point out that in the history of whenever anything new comes along like that, it's only natural that we take on what's come before and try to apply it to the new thing. It, so, for example, when radio came along, people just started doing plays on the radio. And when television came along, they just started doing radio on television, right? And it always takes a while for a new medium to develop its own tropes, its own vocabulary. And he was arguing back in 2000 that the web needed to develop its own tropes, its own vocabulary, instead of imitating print. And yet, no, no, no. What was happening was designers were very much treating the web as if it were print, as if it were fixed. And I was wondering why that was. And I think a lot of it, frankly, it was down to tools, down to technology, the tools we were using to, to build our websites. Um, you know, it's, it's easy to mock WYSIWYG editors like, like Dreamweaver and FrontPage and these things, because the very idea of what you see is what you get is just ridiculous, right? But when I talk about uh, the tools being a problem and how we were approaching web design and web development, I don't just mean you know, uh, uh, code editors like this. Now, when I talk about the tools being a problem, I mean things like graphic design tools that we are using for web design, even though that's not what they were designed for. They were built for an entirely different purpose, for manipulating photographs, for example. The problem is that any tool, any, whether, you know, whether it's hardware or software, everything comes imbued with the philosophy of the people who created it. Um, software doesn't start life in a computer. It's made by a human being. That human being has beliefs, and those beliefs get encoded into the software whether they like it or not. You can't help but imbue software with your beliefs. Uh, so to give you an example of how a tool could influence your thinking without you even thinking about it, um, think about what happens when you go to create a new document in Photoshop. The first thing you do, right? Control N, new document. You input the width and the height. Now, straight away, you've made a fundamental decision about how you're going to design from that point on, probably without even thinking about it, right? The tool is, is influencing you into thinking that way in terms of fixed dimensions of width and height, but having this, this fixed canvas. Um, so, I mean, some people recognized that this was an issue and that, that relying on these sort of graphic design tools for designing for the web wasn't that wasn't the most optimal way. Well, what's the alternative? Well, we could design using a web browser, right? We could actually just get into code straight away and start designing there. That brings with it its own challenges, right? If you work faster in Photoshop than you do in CSS, then it's going to be hard to try and work in the browser. So there was this kind of discussion backwards and forwards, you know, design in the browser, no, design in Photoshop, no, design in the browser. But it was all a fairly kind of uh, academic discussion, right? You know, whatever worked for you. 
But it stopped being an ac academic discussion when the world sort of changed around us, when you know, something like the iPhone came out and suddenly we had access to the web, not some, some you know, WML web, but the actual World Wide Web using a decent web browser, but now on a small screen. And then other phones come out and then tablets, all this stuff comes out. And web designers, web developers just freak out. They're like, what? How do we deal with this? Because with all these different phones and all these different tablets and all these different devices, there's so much that we just don't know. We don't know the network speed of these devices. We don't know whether they support this particular plugin, like Flash. We don't know the screen size of this particular tablet or phone or whatever it happens to be, right? But all of these things that appear to be new unknowns were things that we never knew. And this explosion of devices, mobile, tablets, all this stuff, it wasn't creating new unknowns. It was just throwing into sharp relief the fact that we don't know this stuff, and we never did. We chose to pretend we did, but we never knew any of this stuff. So kind of just pushed it more out into the light, which I was very grateful. It's like, ha ha, where's your god now, fixed with designers, right? <laughs> So how do you deal with this problem? Like, oh my god, we don't know all this stuff. How do we deal with it? Well, a short-term solution that people did for a while was to say, well, that's fine. We'll have the mobile web, a term I despise, where it's like, OK, we've got your regular web, which is built for desktop computers. And then you have a separate website, usually an M dot subdomain. And that's where we'll shunt off the mobile users, this sort of separate but equal subdomain site. Um, it doesn't really scale, right? Have, OK, we've got a mobile site, we've got our desktop site. That's how we'll divide the entire uh, range of devices out there. So, well, where do you send the tablets? To the desktop site, to the mobile site? Where do you send the internet-enabled fridges? Where do you send the internet-enabled cars, right? Car.subdomain.com. It, it just doesn't scale. So the alternative approach is this idea of one web, which is not a new idea. In fact, this is an idea as old as the web itself, which is that any device any user agent should be able to access a URL and get at the content there. Now, it does not mean that any device, any user agent should have the same experience when they access a URL, right? No, no, no. In fact, far from it. Um, but the whole idea of OneWeb is that you're more flexible, right? Embracing the flexibility of the web, be that in terms of screen size, be that in terms of device capability, be that in terms of network speed, that you, you run with it, basically. And this idea of one web is essentially what Ethan was talking about when, when he talk, started talking about uh, responsive web design four years ago now, right? Uh, when he wrote this article in the list apart. And interestingly, if you go back and read Ethan's article, he begins his article by referencing an earlier list apart article, which is a DAO of web design by John Alsop. Because essentially, he's building upon everything that John was saying about the web and about embracing the nature of the web, developing you know, the tropes and the vocabulary of the web as its own medium instead of copying other mediums that come before, being more flexible when it comes to the web. So putting this into the context of visual design that has come before, it's completely different. Now, as Mark Bolton puts it, uh, you have to flip everything on its head, whereas before, in every other medium, we've, we've known these dimensions and we've been able to design inwards from that knowledge. Now, we don't know that. We have to design outwards from the one thing we do know. And what's the one thing we do know? We know our own content, right? We know what we want to publish on the web. That's where we have to start. So this whole idea of needing to, needing to design content out rather than, than canvas in uh, is, a, is a fundamental difference in how we treat visual design, I think. It's, it's, it's different to hundreds of years of everything that's come before. That's a big change because it's not a matter of, well, I need to change my tools or I need to change my processes. No, you need to fundamentally rewire your brain to think about how you design in a completely different way. Right? To stop thinking about filling in rectangles and start thinking about having your content uh, respond to wherever it happens to find itself. And, and that idea of, of, of sort of responding to wherever it happens to find itself uh, is at the heart of one of my favorite quotes about responsive design, which comes from the great designer Trent Walton, where he says that uh, his love of responsive design is the idea that my website will meet you wherever you are. Which I, I love that. If you think about the way we've been designing websites up till now, uh, we were dictating the terms of engagement. Right? The designer was setting the, the terms and conditions. In order to access this site, in order to, to, to have this content available to you, you must have a fast connection. You must have a screen that's at least 800, 1024, whatever pixels wide. You must have 
this particular plugin installed, or you must have this particular JavaScript API available, right? It's entirely one-sided. Whereas with responsive design, in its bigger picture sense, as Sally was talking about, it's much more a two-way conversation, right? where the user and the designer are having a, di a dialogue effectively, saying, well, I've got this kind of browser, I've got this much JavaScript support, I support this, but not that, and the designer accommodating that, saying, okay, that's fine, I can respond to that, we can sort of meet you halfway. So it means fundamentally changing how we think about web design and changing about how we think about what a website is, right? We tend to think about, you know, oh, this is a website in the web browser. When, if I say, think of a website, we think of something like, oh, it looks like this. So maybe in a different browser, but fundamentally we're thinking the same thing. Where actually this is still a website, right? Accessing it in a text-only browser, right? These are just instantiations of the thing, whether it's on a fa newfangled device or, you know, not necessarily the newest, but anywhere. If someone wants to print it out, right, you need to be able to respond to that. Uh, make sure it works in a device that didn't even exist when you were building that website, right? Making sure it works even if it isn't in a visual medium at all. A website should still be able to work even if there isn't a screen. Okay, so I've, I've set the historical uh, precedent, I think, the, the perspective for responsive design. Um, and I'll, I'll shut up very soon, but I thought I would preempt some questions about responsive design by running through things I've, some, some, Misconcern, mis misunderstandings about responsive design I've come across in my time. Um, some a bit less these days, but I'll run through them and maybe I'll get a little bit ranty, so, so bear with me. The number one sort of uh, misconception I come across with responsive design that it's about taking your existing desktop site and squishing it down to make it fit on a small screen. No. Um, <laughs> if you've ever been in that situation, you've ever attempted to do that, you know, the boss says, you've got to make our website responsive. Uh, like the idea that, oh, yeah, I'll, I'll sprinkle some media query fairy dust on top of that and that will work, uh, then it's a world of pain, right? Who's ever had to try and do that? Right? Take an existing... Painful, absolutely painful. And if that were your only experience of responsive design, then I totally get what you think. Responsive design sucks. Um, but no, it's got to be the other way around. Like we talk about mobile first, right? Luke Rubuski's book, Mobile First. Uh, essentially, it's it's saying the same thing. It's, it's this idea of content out. You're beginning with the content and building out from there. Not this idea of, well, I've been thinking in terms of one size rectangle, and now I need to think in terms of a different size rectangle. No, you need to, there is no rectangle. Um, but at the same time, I mean, this is kind of related, uh, there's this perception that responsive design is about mobile. Responsive design is this strategy for dealing with mobile. What's your mobile strategy? Oh, we're going to embrace responsive design. No, uh, mobile is, again, just another instantiation of your website. Seeing your website in a mobile phone, seeing your website in a tablet, seeing it in a desktop computer, they're all instantiations of your website, but responsive design isn't about mobile. Responsive design isn't about desktop. Responsive design is about the web. Right? It's about embracing that inherent flexibility of the web. Mobile can be a, a, a useful cipher to think about responsive design to begin with, right? the easiest thing to grasp, but we shouldn't mistake mobile and responsive design uh, they're very, very uh, separate things. The other uh, issue I come across a lot, especially when I go into talk, talk to company about this, is this idea that, well, responsive design involves um, you know, CSS, media queries, HTML, JavaScript potentially. So therefore, it is a it's a front-end development technique, right? And so it's the responsibility of the front-end uh, department. Um, no. Again, you can't just come in at the end and, and just make it responsive. Um, if anything, about keeping it responsive from the start. Uh, it affects everything. I mean, obviously, it affects visual design. Right? How, do you, how, how does your process need to work now that you can't just design a mock-up in Photoshop that's a certain number of pixels wide and hand it over to your front-end development team? That's not going to work anymore. I would argue that never worked. Again, responsive design just kind of cast it into the light and showed that our processes were broken always. Uh, now we just can't avoid it anymore. But certainly your design, your visual design, has to be affected by responsive design, right? Not just front-end development. And it goes much further back than that. Obviously, the user experience. Now you're not just thinking about the user experience of someone sitting at a desktop using a website with a fast connection. You're thinking about the user experience of all these possible devices in all these possible situations using your website. And it goes further back than that, right? Because uh, you're going to want all those people working together. Well, that's going to affect your project planning. If you were previously throwing things over the wall between you know, UX and design and development, that's just not going to cut it anymore. And it goes further back than that. I would say responsive design you know, goes back to the organization of your office and where people sit. I think 
has a, a massive effect on how effective your responsive design could be. If you have you know, your designers over there and your developers over there, uh, you're going to have a hard time doing responsive design. And I say responsive design, I mean web design, right? Um, it goes all the way back. It is not simply a front-end development technique. Here's something I hear sometimes. Well, responsive design, it's fine for documents, but we're not building documents. Oh, no, no, we're building web apps. Therefore, all the rules are off. We can do whatever we like. Would anybody here like to define web app? And application on the web doesn't cut it. That's a tautology. Oh, Jamie, go for it. Yes. Um, adoption of destination, so that what it has, an app as a place where you go for what it can do. For what it can do. So for, give me an example. So, so somewhere where you, you do verbs, basically. Facebook, yeah, Facebook you go to for what it has content. Yep. So in zero, which is only my account, I go to for what it can do. For what it can do. So you go for what it can do. And so the things you would do there would be, you'd be entering information, uh, right? Yeah. For example, using that example. Um, then having that thing act on that information, right? Uh, you know, combine it, do it, yeah, process it in some, some particular way. Um, there's nothing in that that you can't do using links and forms, using just plain old HTML. Um, and there's nothing in that that can't be displayed on multiple screens, multiple sizes. So this idea of the web app as a, as a get out of jail free card, I really don't understand, especially if you think that the whole reason why people like to use that term web app is that it makes it sound better than website. Ooh, website documents, icky, no. We're web apps and you get to have that same cachet that you get from thinking about you know, native apps or desktop apps. Look at desktop apps, they've always been responsive, right? To grab the, grab the corner of, of your mail client or Photoshop or whatever and change the window size. It works, right? So this idea that somehow, it, I would argue the opposite. Responsive design is actually tougher for documents where you've got to think about line length and you've got to think about where traditionally we've had this idea of a width and a height and a canvas. Uh, that's where I would say is, even, is more of a challenge. Apps, actually uh, easier, I would say, for responsive design. Anyway, I think this, 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 this delineation between documents, apps, or websites, web apps, is a dumb delineation. I will, I will argue with anybody who wants to argue with me about that when it comes to Q&A. Um, don't get me wrong, I, I think there is value in delineating patterns. So, so for example, what James was talking about. Um, uh, let's say you have a pattern of displaying something, then certain design principles and certain design skills are going to be very important. Skills around typography, around white space, around color, around contrast, right? Whereas if it's something that's more about accepting input and dealing with that, uh, processing that input, then you want to have skills around uh, feedback, skills around animation, right? around timing, things like that. And that's really, really useful to, to delineate at that level of the pattern. But the truth is that just about everything out on the web is some mixture of those patterns. There is almost nothing that is entirely uh, consumable without some level of interaction. And there's almost nothing that involves you know, the interaction part without something being displayed back to the user. So everything is some mixture of, of web app, website. It's, it's much more of a continuum than this binary distinction. Also the idea that you could take the entire World Wide Web and divide it into two buckets, websites, web apps. That's crazy. If you're going to have a taxonomy, have a decent taxonomy, not just two things in it, right? Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting, uh, I'm getting ranty. Sorry. <laughs> we can take this up in the bar later. Um, I'll, I, I should finish up. So I'll, I'll, I'll want to bring on something that, that kind of touches on what um, uh, Sally was talking about, this idea of responsive design is ignoring context, right? where the user is, what the user is doing. Twitter say, yes, responsive design is ignoring context, and that is a good thing, pretty much for all the reasons that Sally is pointing out. That there's actually an inherent danger in assuming context from a technology. We fell into this trap a few years ago, this idea of the mobile context. Oh, you're on a mobile phone, therefore you are probably using public transport, and in a real hurry, right? Oh, you're in an airport trying to check in, so we're going to just give you the check-in, and we won't give you any other content because you're a mobile user, and that's your context, right? Making an assumption, a context assumption based on technology is very, very dangerous. The reason why we don't uh, try and design for context, responsive design or not, is that we don't meet read minds. We cannot possibly know somebody's context, and it's really dangerous to make that assumption about it. We can ask them, and that's a decent thing to do. Would you like this? Do you want this? Do you want access to this information? But inferring context from technology is extremely, extremely dangerous. Um, the other thing about this is that you often hear this, like, well, you know, we're making our, our, something for mobile, be it a website, be it a web app, whatever, therefore, 
it needs to you know, get straight to the point. We need to get straight to the content. We, you know, the user needs to be able to accomplish their task really quickly. It's like, well, why just mobile? Why is, why is that suddenly like, not something you want to prioritize for the desktop user or the tablet user or any other user? That there's actually a W3C document called Mobile Web Best Practices. It's been online for years. And if you read it, it's just best practices. In fact, whenever you read something that says, oh, it's best to do blah, blah, blah for mobile, you can usually chop off the for mobile. It's usually just a good idea, right? Epitomized by this, right? Mobile users want to see our menu, hours, and delivery number. Desktop users definitely want to see this one megabyte PNG of someone smiling at a salad. It's like, <laughs> when, did, when did we become acceptable? Say, well, we really want to optimize for mobile, but it's perfectly OK to make the desktop experience suck. Right? It's perfectly OK for everybody else to have a crappy experience. Merlin Mann has this Flickr set he maintains called the noise-to-noise -noise ratio, where he takes sites and he highlights where the content is. In this particular case, this is the content. Everything else around it is not the content, right? It's crap that gets in the way of the content. Now, look, I'm sure if I were to talk to the developers, the designers behind this, they would have very good reasons. For, well, we had to have this, you know, there was this meeting and everyone was shouting and we had to put this on there, we had to put that on there. And this is, I think, the trap we've fallen into in the history of web design is that when we had what we thought was a large canvas to work with, we just threw stuff at it to stop people kicking the shit out of each other in meetings, right? Like, okay, everybody wants to be on the homepage, we'll put everybody on the homepage. But we end up with crap like this, right? Where we're, we're making life tougher for the users. We end up in a world where users now can use tools like readability and Instapaper, where the entire purpose of the tool is to strip away the crap and get the user straight to the content, right? The fact that these tools exist is a damning indictment of us and what we've been building uh, all these years. Um, I should wrap it up. I'll, I'll, I'll finish with, with, with the final sort of misunderstanding. I guess the understanding response design is the only viable approach. And at this point, I should be all even handed and say, that's not true. There's other alternatives. But my heart wouldn't be in it, actually. Um, if you're building a website today and it isn't responsive, it's broken. Um, thank you.